Can we uh, rise, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your presence, for your blessings, for being with us. Now, uh, in a very special way, oh God, bless this congregation. And don't let anyone that came here this morning to go home without receiving a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Opening hymn 245, More About Jesus. 245, More About Jesus. Jesus in its world. 
seated. At this time, I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our worship service. We are so privileged and blessed to have each and every one of you worship with us this day. I would like you to turn to your nearest neighbor and extend a warm welcome and tell them, welcome to Jesus' feet. Welcome to Jesus' feet. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Welcome at Jesus' feet. Correct, correct. We are all seated at Jesus' feet. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right then. Very good. Thank you, thank you. I'm seeing those smiles, beautiful smiles. We praise God for each and every one of you. Praise God. How many are visiting us for the first time? Anyone in our midst who is here for the first time? All right. I can see our brother Paul. <laughs> I know he was with us last Sabbath and he's here today. So we thank God for you, brother Paul. Could you please say hi to the congregation? Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. What do we say, church family? Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath and welcome, brother Paul. Brother Paul has been attending with us the seminars which are going on since the beginning of this month of April, and they'll be ending next Sabbath. So we are very happy to have you here, Brother Paul. So feel most welcome. And those ones who are watching online, we also say welcome. Thank you for being uh, here. Thank you for tuning in. And we are so happy that you are here today. At this time, we are going to have a prayer session. How many have unspoken prayer requests? All those hands as they go up, God sees them. He knows what the request is. God will grant it in his own timing according to his will. Any spoken prayer requests? Yes, uh, Sister Sofni. To pray, for, to pray for Sister Liana. So God is the great physician. We'll continue remembering her in prayer. We'll pray for Sister Liana. Yes, Sister Mori. To come to the Lord. His name is Kioni Mari. Yes, to come to the Lord. Yes, we'll pray for Brother Kioni. Yes, uh, sister? Anytime you see me, I just stop. I'm praying for everyone. Yes, remind me your name again? Carmen. Yes, sister Carmen, praying for our job. Yes, Brother Pastor Kioni. I've been requesting prayers for the uh, Pastor Martinez's wife in Puerto Rico. She's undergoing a chemotherapy for cancer. She's doing much, much better. And also, Pastor Ruiz called me. Uh, couple of weeks ago, to request prayer for his daughter, who has a, uh, is a, uh, I forgot the name of the thing, but uh, it's uh, something that goes around his body, so uh, uh, jingles, jingles, and it got into her eye. She was in a very bad situation. Last weekend, I was in Maryland preaching, and we asked the church to pray for her. He called me last night, Rafael, my daughter is healed. Amen. It went away. Prayer works, as I'm saying. If you have a prayer request, bring it to church. Prayer is powerful. Amen. God answers prayers. Any other? Yes, Sister Louise.
and we, we remember uh, we remember Sister Luis's brother for all those that he's going through. That God will intervene, be able to help to restore his health and his strength. So we pray for the seminar going on in Belize that about the gang violence and that God will be touching people's lives. A crusade. Very good. We'll be able to pray for God's spirit to move. Yes, our brother, please. Uh, two, uh, Request. Two questions. Yes. One. Jacqueline, and your name? My name is Mario. Mario. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much, Mario, for those two requests. We remember to commit them to prayer. Yes, uh, Brother Ross. Thank you for that request, Brother Ross. Any other? Yes, Sister Marie. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for all those requests. Yes, Sister Louise. So we'll be able to sing hymn number 671 as we kneel for those who are able to kneel. And then after that song, we'll take a minute of personal meditation and reflection. And then after that, we'll be able to crown it all from us.
Our Father and our God who art in heaven, we praise you and thank you for gathering us in your house of worship on this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for Jesus who died for us on the cross of Calvary and made it possible for us to be reconciled with you because we were completely alienated from you because of sin. But now through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, through his atoning sacrifice, we have been reconciled, made one with you. We praise you and thank you for the gift of the Sabbath that you have given us that reminds us you are our creator God. You are our soon coming king. Thank you for each family represented here. Thank you for everyone that is here in the sanctuary and even those who are with us online. We praise you and thank you for all the prayer requests that have been offered this day. The unspoken prayer requests, you saw the hands went up. You know each one's request. May you grant it in your own timing according to your will for your namesake, for your honor and glory. Wash us with the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ, that was shed on the cross of Calvary. May you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Forgive us of all our sins, that nothing will stand between us and you, that nothing will hinder our prayers, Lord, that all you will have your way in and through us, that through this request you may glorify yourself, that your name will be praised. We want to remember in a very special way a prayer of healing for Sister Eliana, for Sister Eda, a prayer of healing for Sister Louise's brother, Leroy, a prayer of healing for uh, the pastor's wife, Pastor Martinez, uh, and uh, all others who are not feeling well. How we pray that, Lord, you may intervene in their health, that you may bring uh, healing and restoration, not according to our will, but we are praying that your will will be done. That after they feel better, all these that we mentioned, and even all those that we were not able to mention their names, once they get better, all praises, all honor, and the glory will be unto your name, Lord. How we pray for a job for Sister Carmen and for Sister Jacqueline, who lost her teaching job. All these are your daughters. You love them, Lord. May you provide jobs for them. Even as they go knocking on doors, Lord, may you open doors for them that they can be able to obtain a job and they will come back here to give a testimony on your faithfulness. And many of your people will be encouraged, will be strengthened in their faith. Lord, may you continue working on their behalf and may you continue leading in their search for a job. And also, Lord, we remember uh, Brother Keone Murray, who needs to come to the Lord. Also, LeSean and Yashire, that they will come to the truth. We remember all this, and together with the many other seekers for truth, that, Lord, you may lead them, that they will come to the truth. They will come to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Continue knocking on their doors, as you say in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, and they will eat with me. Lord, may this, together with any other of our family members, any other of our loved ones, any other of our friends or colleagues at work or anywhere, even our neighbors where we live, may you bring them to the truth. May you save them, Lord, into your kingdom. How we pray for all our youth. Lord, may you continue helping them. They are living in our times. These are perilous times, Lord. Open their eyes that they may be able to see you as you truly are. That the world may not deceive them. That the influences, the wrong influences out there, that they may not deceive them. That they will be drawn to you, Lord, and be saved into your kingdom. How we remember the crusade going on in Belize. That is where all the gang violence has been happening in Belize. How we pray that your Holy Spirit will move to touch people's lives. That many will be saved into your kingdom, Lord. May you be with the speakers of, of this crusade. And may your Holy Spirit continue to be with those members attending the crusade. And that, Lord, you will bring to an end all the gang violence in this city and many other places in the world, Lord. May you be in our midst now as we continue with our worship service. We invite your presence to continue with us. As Pastor Raphael breaks the bread of life, Lord, may you give him the special anointing of the double portion of your Holy Spirit. And also, us who are listening, open our ears. Give us that spiritual hearing that, Lord, will be able to hear your voice speaking afresh to us and help us to work and unto you. May you fulfill your will in our lives. And may you save all of us in our lives, Lord. Save us into your kingdom. May you write our names in the book of life. May your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you. At this time, we are going to worship God through tithes and offerings. And we are welcoming Brother Ben to do the overtory reading. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath again. Happy Sabbath. Today's overture reading is for Blue Mountain Academy. And I'm going to read. Um, rooted in a family, rooted in a family deeply connected to prayer, Rolian Coley parents sought God's guidance for her education from a young age. When I was five years old, I remember seeing my parents kneel constantly to pray in search of God's guidance for my plans in education, Rorian shares. A turning point came when her uncle, Emmanuel Asiedu, proposed Blue Mountain Academy as an option. Rorian reflects, I know my uncle's proposal was a sign from God. Here I have been able to understand my Adventist beliefs, develop my leadership skills, and manage uh, my life, my time. Reflecting on the, on the supportive community, Rolian expresses gratitude. Ever since I set foot at this place, I have experienced a supportive family through the staff. She acknowledges, she acknowledges the staff's dedication sharing. There was a time when I was falling behind with work and my teachers looked for ways to help me, putting extra time into their busy day. Now, a PMA junior, Rolian contemplates her future, recognizing that she has enjoyed assisting the dean and discovering her passion for working with the people. While her, assumption, while her aspirations are still taking shape, she envisions working with small children, possibly as a teacher or a pediatrician. Your gift today is Blue Mountain Academy offering with help shape the future for students like Rolian, helping them to discover their passions and talents as they consider careers and how God wants them to impact the world. Please bravely consider what you can provide for this world-changing offering today. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come unto you this morning with amen, with amen thanksgiving from our hearts, Father. Thank you for enabling each and every one of us to be here today to worship you. At this moment, we are going to collect what you have blessed us with. May you help us to give cheerfully, and may you multiply to go out and win more soul for your kingdom, Father. This is a humble prayer in Jesus' name. Do we have a video? Oh, uh, we do have a video. Uh, maybe, maybe we can collect as the video runs, right? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Happy Sabbath, friends. Spring is here and the scenes of death are being replaced with a panorama of life appearing all around us. You know, our spiritual life is like this. Jesus finds us dead in our sins and then the Holy Spirit convicts our minds of something better. And if we choose to let him, he works a miracle of life in us. We were blessed to witness this new life springing up in the hearts of our students. I pray that you will be inspired as two of our young men share what God has done in their lives. Hey, I'm Isaac, and I'm a senior here to talk about my BMA experience. Hello, my name is Zeph, and I'm a junior here at Blue Mountain Academy. First, I want to start off by saying, when I came to BMA, I did not want to be here. You know, as a kid who had all the freedom in the world at home, when my parents told me that I was coming here, I was very upset. You know, I thought, oh, I'm going to have all these rules and restrictions put on me, so why would I want to be in a place like that? But as time went by, I realized, Wow, the teachers here, they're super spiritual. We have worships at the beginning of every class. Wow, the students, they really seem to care about God and care about what he thinks and what he says that we should do as sinful beings. You know, 
And being surrounded by that environment, being in that environment, I realized like there's more to life than, you know, having freedom and being able to do whatever you want at home. And before I got here to Blue Mountain Academy, I remember I was in COVID, online school during that time, and my life wasn't the best. I had a lot of bad habits and I was doing really poorly in school and my spiritual life with God wasn't the best at all. I was feeling very disconnected from him. This was about two, three years before I got to BMA. But when you come here and you're surrounded um, by people that care about God and care about what God wants for their lives, you realize that, wow, like, I was thinking so narrow-mindedly, I was being so myopic. And now that I'm here, now that I'm a senior, I'm a two-year senior, I realized that and that led me to get baptized actually. And being baptized, I, I felt like I was made new in God. And I felt like God was revealing to me the callings that he had for me in my life. But after I got to BMA, I started to feel better. I had friends who were, friends of teachers who were more spiritual they guided me onto the right path and I had teachers who actually cared and were actually teaching me skills that were gonna be important in my life. And two or three years later, after I've been here at BMA, I can say that God has definitely been working in this academy and that the teachers that I've met and the friends, the friendships that I've developed have developed me into the person that I am by the grace of God today. And that's why I wanna say that if you're doubting, if you're having second thoughts on whether or not you should come to BMA or any Adventist school, um, don't think about it too hard. Just think like, I'm going to an environment, I'm gonna be in a place where God is the main focus, always. So give it a try, give it a shot, and come with us. The Bible tells us in Luke 15, seven, that all of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents and turns to Christ. I imagine heaven must have been exploding with joy as two of his loved children took their stand for Christ. It is our goal at Blue Mountain Academy that heaven has reason to continually ring with rejoicing. We've had baptisms earlier this year, and there are more planned before the school year ends. This is exciting, but here's our dilemma. There are countless other young people who are desperate to be part of an environment where they can grow spiritually and prepare to take their stand on the Lord's side. Your generous financial gifts provide for these opportunities. Whether it's a smaller gift of $50 to $100 or larger gifts of $500 or more, all form a vital part of providing for our children. After all, these are the future of our church. Thank you for keeping BMA in your prayers and financial planning. And may God bless us all as we do our part to prepare for the return of Jesus. May we be seated, church family. At this time, we're welcoming uh, the children to go to the back and uh, do the lamps offering as Sister Louise Minlach uh, prepares to do the children's story. So all the children, please walk back softly to get the lamps offering. While they are doing that, I would like to recognize my brother Joseph Mayeka and his dear wife Yukabe. They are in our midst. They came after we had welcomed the visitors. They come to us from New Jersey, New Karibu Maranada SDA Church. So, brother Joseph and uh, sister Yukabe, please wave to the congregation. I know you came in after we had already welcomed the visitors. We are glad to have you here. Welcome. Amen.
Just come and give Louise a microphone. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's such pretty faces and smiles today. Okay. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about America and its beginnings. Okay. And um, I want to talk. start by saying biblical morality. I looked on Google and it says... It's the standard of right and wrong that was established by Jesus Christ and taught by his disciples. It is based on two foundations, loving God and loving people. And that's from Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. And then I'm going to talk about our founding fathers. And in Wikipedia, founding fathers are described as a group of late 18th century American revolutionary leaders who united the 13 co colonies, those are the beginning states of our country, and um, they oversaw the war of independence from Great Britain. We used to be under Great Britain instead of a free nation, and um, established the United States of America, and they crafted a framework of government for the new nation. So um, our country was founded on the freedom of religion and they sought to get away from all the persecution over in the old country and they came and discovered America here and um, established themselves here. So America is not only one of the greatest nations in the history of the world, it has also become its longest ongoing constitutional Republic. Its original government has now endured well over two centuries, and however American's longevity is only stable and secure as its foundation okay, of American government. And the foundation of American government, that is our Constitution. So political scientists now know that the greatest single source of in political inspiration for our founding fathers was, was the Bible. It was the Bible here. So the, Bi um, the Bible was very important in the founding, uh, um, in the creation of our uh, Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Um, the Bible was cited 34% of the quotations from the founding era, 1760 to 1805. Our nation was built on godly principles. This discovery, while it might surprise many today, would come as no surprise to its founders. And John Adams, who also signed the, um, the Constitution, said, biblical morality produces a free society, and our founding fathers wanted us to have freedom. So the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. He said, our constitution was made for moral and religious people, meaning that it wouldn't work for other nations that didn't have the underpinning or the foundation of the moral values. So. We have here that, um, let me see the name. The uh, religion was, which has introduced civil liberty in the religion of Christ and his apostles. This is genuine Christianity, and this we owe our free constitutions of government. Okay, so um, Patrick Henry said, whether this new government will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use of our people make of the blessings which a gracious God has bestowed on us. 
And if they are wise, they will be great and happy. If they are contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteous alone, righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. So whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy spare practice virtue, thyself encourage it in others. And Thomas Jefferson said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they are not to be violated, but with his wrath? Indeed, I tremble for my country. I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. So we see that a lot of our forefathers, our founding fathers, you know, um, were very strong faith-based people. So uh, contrary to what is um, asserted today, the founders never intended that God's word or his principles be separated from his public life. They knew these principles were to be vital to the success of our new government, and that James Madison explained, before any man can be considered a member of civil society, he must be considered as the subject of governor of the universe and to the same divine author of every good and perfect gift. And that's from James 1.17. And they're talking about knowing God, how important it is to know God. We are indebted for all these privileges and advantages, religious religions as well as civil, which are so richly enjoyed in this land. We are very blessed in the United States. Now, Benjamin Rush, he, um, also, he's also one of the founders. He's seen the Bible as inseparable from public and education. And he was the first founder to call for national public schools. Before that, the church taught the children. And I brought with me an example of a little primer that they learned and studied from in uh, the beginning of our, uh, our country's growth. And it was all around the Bible. If you'd like to look at it, if someone like to look at it or pass it around, can open it up and look at it. But he says, let the children be carefully instructed in the principles and obligations of the Christian religion. This is the most essential part of education. The great enemy of the salvation of man, in my opinion, never intent invented a more effectual means of extirpating or removing Christianity from the world than by persuading mankind that it was improper to read the Bible at school. He promoted Bible reading in the public school. And we see that society today has been pulling it out of our public school system. So um, they viewed the principles, our founders viewed the principles of the Bible as inseparable from civil law. Now James Will Wilson, a signer of the Constitution and an original justice on the US Supreme Court, he explained, Human law must stress its authority ultimately upon the authority that law which divine, far from being um, rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends and mutual assistants. Indeed, these two sciences run into each other. And this is the man who sat on the US Supreme Court and he is saying that law and religion go side by side, not separate here. So we see here that these statements, despite the um, prominence of those who made them, are virtually unknown today. So for the last four decades, we have been taught that our founders were irreligious, desiring a complete separation between religious principles and public policy. However, the facts dispute this. And so now first, the founding fathers, they created um, 
some lasting legacies here. An overwhelming majority of these men were firmly committed to the principles of God's word, that they went to great lengths to propagate these principles. For example, many founders helped organize and lead several of the Christian societies which today are spreading the gospel. The American Tract Society, the American um, School Sunday School Union. We know we operate on the Sabbath, but there's many good Christian people here. And this, you know, so um, the American Board of Foreign Missions, the Christian Constitutional Society, and many others. Second, consider their words or their lack thereof. Today, well-known phrase is separation of church and state appears in no part of the Constitution. Furthermore, the discussion of 90, 90 founding fathers who framed the First Amendment, which the courts now tell us means separation of church and state, are recorded in the discussions. Did one of these founders ever mention that phrase? It doesn't, doesn't it seem logical that they had intended today's doctrine of separation of church and state? that at least one of these 90 would have said something um, today. So, all right, okay. Go here, okay. So, the whole premise of our founding fathers is they wanted to give freedom to the people. They recognized the role of government was very restrictive and that government purpose was to protect our God-given rights. That is what they outlined in the Declaration. This is the reason government exists. But the only way that makes sense or works as if we're going to give freedom to people, they have to have a uniform code of morals upon which they're going to govern themselves. Because if you give freedom to immoral people, then you need more government to control and restrain the immorality, so freedom only works when you have people who have moral code. They're going to follow this, and that is why the Founding Fathers promoted biblical truth. Today we might argue that maybe they um, weren't Christians because they didn't believe, but the President, um, not President, but Benjamin Franklin, he wrote a letter, and he said that he's totally sure that there is a God who created the universe. I know that he governs it by his providence, and I know that he rewards the good and punishes the evil. I know he gives us the Bible for direction. He still acknowledged we had biblical truth in our nation because that's the only way our freedom works is when everybody understands you don't murder, you don't commit adultery, you don't steal, you don't covet your neighbor's stuff. That is the underpinning or the foundation that allows American America to function. So that's my story for today on America, and I'd like to thank you for sitting and listening so wonderfully. Um, can I get anybody to say a prayer for me? Would you like to say? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that we have learned a lot about your word and that we can continue to serve you and bless you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. I am so sorry. Thank you. Oh, God in heaven, thank you all this day. Help us appear to go to church. Keep us safe to avoid your light. Please let me go to church. I want to be safe, be true, be God, be special, be true. Everyone, amen. 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 And, amen. And heaven can feel blessed, so boys in Jesus, amen. Amen.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. The kingdom come, thou will be done on earth as it is on heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Louise, for that children's story. And thank you, everyone, for being attentive and participating in the children's story. Praise God. So at this time, we are uh, inviting uh, Brother Alan for a special music. After that, Jerry will be able to read the scriptures before Pastor Pierre will be able to stand up. All right. Yeah, special music from Brother Alan. Good morning, church family. So our scripture reading today comes from Matthew 11, verse 28. Oh, my apologies. It's uh, Matthew 7, verse 23. And it says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you you who practice law, you you who practice law, lawlessness. May God bless His word. So at this time, we welcome Pastor Raphael to break the bread of life. Amen. Together with me, say, welcome Pastor Raphael, and bring us the word of God. Pastor, welcome. 
Just give me a second. One, two, three, there you go. You got it? You can hear me now, right? But in the past few weeks, we have been holding a crusade in the church regarding uh, revelation prophecies. And today, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to uh, develop a subject regarding uh, the, sec the first beast of Revelation, chapter 13. Uh, last night, we talked about chapter 12 of Revelation and about chapter 17. In the book of uh, Revelation chapter 12, you have a dragon that, who is depicted as a, as a red dragon. Red dragon. That dragon represents Satan originally. But then it also represents Rome because the dragon, Satan, used Herod, King Herod, to try to kill the baby boy that was born, Jesus. Jesus went to heaven. A were developing heaven, a war, and Michael, which is, who is Jesus, expelled Satan and his angels from heaven. Then the woman fled to the wilderness for 1260 days. And the serpent decided to send throw water, flooding after the, the woman. He tried to kill the baby boy. Now he's trying to kill the woman. He wants to dr uh, drown her. And the wilderness helped the woman. And then that woman is described in verse 17 as the ones who have the testimony of Jesus. They keep the commandments. That word keep, keep the commandments. Keep means treasure. You keep something in your pocket. That word keep it means to treasure something. We treasure the commandments of God. We treasure them. We regard, regard them in high, high value, high esteem. And we have the testimony of Jesus. Okay? The testimony of Jesus is related in Matthew, in Revelation 19.10 with the spirit of prophecy. Spirit of prophecy. Why? Because the testimony is about Jesus. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 10 says, this is the testimony that God has granted us life and this life is in his son. Whoever has his son has life. Whoever do not have his son don't have life. Now, the true prophet the true prophet is one that raises Jesus. Ellen G. White said, my whole subject in public and in private, in voice and in written, is the life of Christ. That's the testimony of a true prophet. She raised Jesus before the world. That she held the testimony of Jesus. I invite you to read the book, Desire of Ages. You haven't read that book yet. And the book, Steps to Christ. And you're going to see what I'm talking about. Now, this dragon was red. If we go to Revelation chapter 17, let's go there right away. Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, you see a harlot, a great harlot, not, not, not any harlot. It's called the great harlot. It's the biggest harlot of all. The worst, the most important. And all the kings of the earth have committed adultery or fornication with her. But then, this harlot, according to verse 3, is seated over a beast. What is the color of that beast? According to verse 3. What is the color of that beast? Red, like the dragon. Okay? And then, in verse 4, who can read verse 4? Who can read it? I want to, who can read verse 4? Who has it? 17.4. 
and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with the gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. This woman is attired with a dress that has two colors. What are those two colors? Scarlet, what is scarlet? What color is scarlet? Red, and what's the other color? Purple. In Revelation chapter 12, we have a, a woman that is the church of God. The church of God in the Old Testament times and the church of God in the New Testament times. The church of God, church of God. But in Revelation chapter 17, we have another woman, the counterpart of that woman. But this one is seated over the beast that represents Rome. And last night, we read chapter 17, and we read verse 9. Who can read verse 9? Verse 9, who can read it? Thomas, brother Thomas. Revelation 17, verse 9. And here is the mind which had wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman seated. This woman that dresses in scarlet and purple, who sits on top of the beast, riding the beast like the beast was a horse, her place, her ge geographic place, her geographic location is in a place that has seven mountains, seven hills. If you read history, if you took history in school, which city in this planet was built over seven hills? Rome. This woman is from Rome. This false religion is from Rome, not from the United States, not from America, not from South America, Central America, or Asia, it's from Rome. These two colors distinguish her. Can, I, can you... Uh, Put that picture in the screen, please, on the TV, the picture that I gave you. Check this up when it comes up. What two colors you can see over there? Purple and scarlet. The, this woman that is described as the mother of the, the, the great harlot, she's the mother in verse, he has a bunch of things that he says. Uh, in verse 5, who can read verse 5 before we go? I make another comment. Who can read verse 5? 17.5. Sister Marie. Revelation 17, verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of what? Harlots. These harlots are false religions that adulterate, fornicate with the human beings. And uh, she's the mother of all religions. Listen, the mother of all religions. All religions came out of there. But something else. Verse. Four again. Let's read verse four again. But I'm going to emphasize on something else. We're going to read verse four again. Verse four. Who, who, can, who has it? And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. Full what, of you, what, what, what? What she had in her hand? Having a golden, a golden cup, cup in her hand. I want that golden cup hat. Keep on reading. Is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Full of abomina abominations and filthiness. Now, the center of the worship of this church is the cup. You can see at the end, at the very end, the priest with the cup in the hand. They say this cup contains the real blood of Jesus. Last night we talked a lot about that. But most of you were not here last night. They say that when the priest raises the cup and they call, they, he's behind this table, this table like this, they call this table the altar. The table that you see in the Catholic Church is the altar. It's not a table, it's the altar. 
What, is the altars, what are the altars used for? Sacrifices. They say in the books that when the priest raises the cup, he orders the Lamb of God to come down from heaven, lay it down on the altar to be sacrificed again during the Mass. And that that blood, that wine that they have in the cup, by the miracle of transubstantiation, becomes the real blood of Jesus. And when they drink the cup, they said the blood of Jesus. Not wine, the blood of Jesus. A miracle of transubstantiation occurs, and that wine becomes blood. Same thing with the bread. When they present the bread, they say that transubstantiation occurred, and that piece of bread becomes the body of Christ, and they give you the body of Christ. In the Bible, the Lord's Supper is a commemoration, it's a remembrance of Christ's death. Christ said, do this in memory of me. But this church says, this is a real sacrifice. We are sacrificing Jesus. We are not criticizing the church. I have many priests that are friends of mine. Many Catholics are friends of mine. We are not here criticizing any church or pointing fingers to any church. This is like a religion class. We are saying, we are reading what the Bible says and pinpointing where this Bible leads us with this prophecy. Okay? Something else. Let's move to Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. We have to move. We have 10 more minutes. Daniel 7, 25. Who can read it? Who has it? Daniel 7, 25. Who has it? Go ahead, Thomas. Daniel 7, 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until our time and the times and the dividing of time. What we plan to do with the law? To change. Change the law. This beast, this little horn, in, Re in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn comes out of Rome, the head that represents Rome, and takes away three horns. We read on the Wednesday section of our Sabbath school that this church came out because there were three kingdoms, the Visigoths, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They were Aryans. What Aryans means? These three nations, these three Vandal tribes that were part of the Roman Empire, became Arians. There was a Catholic priest called Arius, and Arius thought that Jesus was created. And these three nations adopted that teaching. And the Catholic Church said, no way, and they persecuted them and they defeated them. In 538, they defeated the Ostrogoths, the last Arian nation. Arian here doesn't mean white, it means followers of Arius the person who invented the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses follow, saying that Jesus is created, okay? And the Catholic Church vanquished them, defeated them. The last one in 538, you add time, times and a half of time, or 1260 days, or 42 prophetic months, it leads you to one, nine, nine, 1798, when Napoleon Bonaparte, Saint General Berthier, and took the Pope captive and took him to Valencia, Valencia, France, where he died in captivity. This is prophecy. Now, let's move now to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. Remember that Daniel 7.25 says that this little horn, the Antichrist, that comes out of Rome, is planning to change the law of God. Now, Paul is talking about this power in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How he names this power, 
Who can read it? Do you have it? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Listen, listen to this verse. Uh, second, second Thessalonians 2, two verse 8. And then, the, and then the lawless, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the bread of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. It's a shame that the Hispanic Bibles do not say lawless man. They say the iniquity. It says iniquity. But this Bible translated that properly, the lawlessness, the lawless man. In the Greek text, the word is anomos. Paul called him anomos. This is the Greek word, anomos. And in, in English, anomos. Anomos is the lawless one. Nomos, if you say nomos without the A, it means law. Nomos means law. Anomos means against the law. Okay? The A is a negative thing. It's like normal and abnormal. Okay? This means anti against the law. The one who's against the law. Who do you think is who do you think Paul is talking about? Daniel 7.25. The little horn. Okay? That's why he calls him in verse 4. Let me say I think it's verse 4. Let me double check. I don't want to, to give you a wrong text. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse. Uh, let me see. Verse 7, the mystery of what? Lawlessness. lawlessness. This power, this little horn is the mystery, it's also called the mystery of lawlessness. Anomian. Then he uses another word, anomian. Anomian in Greek. Lawlessness. Anomian. anomian. Now, let's move to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I have to divide the sermon in two because of the time. Next time I'm going to do the part that deals with the three rests of God. We, we have no time today for that. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Many people say, why Seventh-day Adventists put too much, too much emphasis in the law at the end of the times? Why? And they make fun of us. Why Seventh-day Adventists talk about the, the importance of the law at the end of the times? Why? Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Can you read it, uh, Johnson? Yeah, I can read it. Matthew 7, verse 21. 7, 21 to 23. To 23. Uh, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I would tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Evildoers, he says. You know something? You know, the Greek text doesn't say evildoers. Oh. It says anomian. Read that last last. Uh, phrase again, the last phrase of the verse 23. Uh, verse 23. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Evildoers. In the Greek text it says, doers of anomian, transgressors of the law. That's what it says. When Jesus comes on that day, people will say, we did miracles, God, Jesus. We did miracles. We proclaim your name. We prophesied. And Jesus says, depart from me, transgressors of the law, anomian. Do you get it? Do you get it? The people who translate our Bibles in this verse did not translate this word appropriately. Jesus says, away from me, get away from me, anomian, transgressors of the law. The law is going to pay 
play a very important role in the last times. When you see the false prophet, and come tonight if you want to hear that, the prophet doing miracles through a false revival, people will be engaged in revival, and that's false revival, miracles and prophesizing. Jesus, Jesus. But they despise the law of God. They have no respect for the law of God. They do not delight in the law of God. And Jesus will tell them, but God, we did this, we did this, we did that. Depart from me, transgressors of the law. You did not keep my law. That's why the church of God is described, and the ones who have the faith of Jesus, and, the, and what else they have? They keep the commandments. They treasure the commandments of God. Like the apostle Paul, keeping the law is a delight for them, according to Romans 7, 22. In the last times, we're going to have two movements on this planet. The movement that preaches the three angel message. The three angel messages. And the beast and the false prophet. Two sides. There will be no more choices. Or you're here, or you're here. God raised this church as a prophetic movement to proclaim the three angels' message before the harvest of the earth, which represents the end of the world. And our church is doing that right now. We are preaching that message. Even though many members are not doing it. But in general, our church is doing that all over the planet. Many people are coming and coming and coming and coming to our church. Last week, last Saturday, I preached in uh, Frederick, Maryland, and there was a bunch of visitors in the church. I was so happy to see that church full of with young people. Oh, my God. Like this one. Young people. A lot of young people in the church. And children said, this, is, this church has a future. And many visitors, many Catholics. I recall a lady that came out and said, Raphael, I learned something today. I have to stay here. A Catholic church member. When she heard this sermon Amen. last week in a different way, but practically a sermon very similar to this one with the same topic. People need to hear this message. And God raised this church with this objective. We need to share this message of salvation to others and admon uh, uh, admonish people that God's law is still binding for human beings. They want to keep nine, but not the tenth. Not ten, just nine. James says, if you keep all the commandments but one, you are guilty of them all. My prayer today is that all of us acknowledge the times we are living in. We have this movement trying to control the planet. While sometimes our church is sleeping, we need to wake up and do our work because the time is very close. Christ is coming very, very soon. May God bless you all.
Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Jesse, my son, is here today with us. Jesse, welcome. This is your church. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, who art in heaven, we thank you for your word that you have delivered to us through your main servant, Pastor Akiel. And now, Lord, as we continue to study the prophecies and as we see them being fulfilled in these last days, May you draw us closer and closer to yourself. Prepare us for your soon return. May you forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. And may we continue searching the scriptures every day, lest we be deceived. May your will be done, even as we break now to go for our fellowship uh, meal. May your presence continue with us. And again, when we come back in the evening for the remaining presentations, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue guiding. May you be with each and every one of us, Lord. Disperse us with your blessings is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You want to know what the fire that comes from heaven, is the, the, the fire that the false prophet brings from heaven, not from heaven, come tonight at 7. So may we be seated, church family. As we are being ushered out, there is going to be a little change downstairs. We have reserved the fellowship hall for a function which we have tonight. We have a pre-wedding uh, uh, celebration for Brother Jasper and Sister Charity. And so we are not going to eat in the fellowship hall as we normally do, but we shall be able to eat in the primary and in the junior rooms. We shall draw the petition and we shall have the two rooms for our fellowship meal. We reserve the hall for what the function we have tonight. Thank you very much. So may we be ushered out, please. <laughs> 